I've set up a small experiment to see if Thomas, who's blindfolded, can tell which elements I'm going to pass him and he's going to tell me what material it's made out of. Let's see if you can get this one. Nickel chromium type. Fantastic. Nickel Good guess. Good guess correct. Hi and welcome. Today we're going to look at the process of choosing the correct electrical heating elements. This is easier said than done because there are many variables. Luckily enough for me, I've got our resident expert with us, Thomas. Thomas, good to see you. Nice to have you here, Stephen. Thomas, we've got an array of elements in front of us. Why is it important to choose the correct elements? If you make the wrong choice from the beginning, it could be very costly in the future. Maybe even have to rebuild the furnace for future purpose. That's costly. Very costly. So what we'll do now, we'll steer you through the optimal process of choosing the correct elements. One of the most important factors to consider is what furnace temperature you require for your heating process. Thomas, we have the array of elements on our desk. We've got three different material types. Walk me through the temperature for each different material. Yeah. If we start here, we have the metallic type, the amanda type. The process temperature can go up to 1400 C. So pretty hot? Yes. Hot. And in order to get even higher, we have the silicon carbide type, ceramic element. Here we have the this tubular one? shape. Yes. Yeah. And here we can go up to 1550C. So higher than the metallic? Yeah. And then obviously we've got the third type, which again is this uh, ceramic. Yeah, it's the kind of super where we can go up to a process temperature of 1650C. Okay, so we're going from the, the, the hot, but not hottest, metallic, ceramic, and then ceramic. Yeah. What other factors should we consider when choosing the different types of material? There are a number of factors, of course, but uh, for sure, the process temperature is the most important one. Okay, and let's walk through the others. Now we move on to furnace atmospheres. So metallic elements, tell me good atmospheres to work in and not so good. Yeah, most atmospheres, like uh, reducing and oxidizing atmospheres, are okay. We are talking about the dew point. And uh, what could be tricky are corrosive atmospheres, where you have like chlorine or uh, uh, fluorine, that yeah. could reduce the protective oxide on those elements. The metallic elements, they are based on the alumina oxide or uh, the, the chromium uh, silica oxide. But any others, vacuums, etc. Yeah, uh, carburizing is a very important application and also a resistance to carburizing atmosphere and that's also due to the oxide. Okay, the so they go to work in a carburizing yeah, uh, furnace. Uh, vacuum furnaces also okay. Uh, there might be a need of reoxidation again, or reforming the alumina layer on them. If, if the alumina layer is not reformed, what happens to the elements? Uh, the vapor pressure of the uh, metals inside the alloying element will uh, actually evaporize. And that ultimately yeah. leads to? Breakage. Premature failure. Yeah. Okay, so all is with that. If we move on to the actual silicon carbide elements, again, what atmospheres are we looking to uh, operate these, these into? Yeah, most atmospheres are okay. The one really tricky is the one where we have a lot of oxygen, like in a moisture atmosphere. Okay. Any reason why the moisture is not good for the elements? Uh, it will form too much oxide, so it will actually uh, make the element to crack. Ah, so we've got an issue there. Is there anything you can do to the actual element to protect it in that yeah. Uh, environment? Yeah, you can put the glaze on it to improve the resistance towards uh, moisture. And that's a glaze that obviously just coats the outside of yeah. the elements. Yeah. It looks maybe not that good, but it's good for the element. And gives that extra life and extra protection. Exactly. So knowing if there's high moisture content in your furnace, and you're operating maybe at a higher temperatures than the metallic elements, you want to have a glaze. Exactly. And then if we move on to the actual super, yep. any environments where they're good and obviously where we should take care? Uh, this element type is uh, relying on the quartz, the silica layer. And uh, if that is being reduced, like in the hydrogen uh, atmospheres, where the dew point is very low, then this element will not work. But so hydrogen is not applicable to use with? To a certain extent, it's all about the dew point. Okay, so we obviously if we've got a customer who's looking at using a high temperature and needs super, 
with hydrogen, obviously come to the Campbell yeah. experts and talk about the dew points. Exactly. And we can put them in the right direction. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Let's move on to power density. Thomas, what's that all about? Yeah, first of all, we have two different power densities and that uh, is dependent upon what uh, kind of uh, volume you have. We have the ones where we talk about volume density and then we have the ones where we mount them on the wall on a roof and we talk about surface density. So these because obviously they're covering the surface area, yeah. those because they're more tubular, yeah. volumetric. Yeah. How does the power density relate to the different types of elements? Yeah, uh, the power density on the elements uh, can be higher on the ceramic uh, type of elements, but uh, the freedom in forming the metallic elements can actually bring up the wall surface loading very high for the metallic elements. These but elements here? Yes, but the limitation here is always the element temperature, which is dependent upon the process. So if we've got a element that say is working at 800 degrees, the power density would be higher. It can be very high for these ones, yes. And it, but if it's working at its maximum, say 1300. Yeah, it has to be uh, dramatically reduced. Okay, so obviously it is temperature related. Yes. Higher density, lower, lower temperature, low temperature, high density. Exactly. Does that perform the same with the ceramic elements? The same, yes. Okay but we can get more power density from the ceramic elements? In general, yes. Okay. The, the exception is the tubular element, I would say, where we use okay. the APM wire based on powder metallurgical process. Then we can actually achieve the same power density up to, let's say, uh, 1100 degrees C for metallic elements as you have for the ceramic types. So the tubular, even though it's metallic, can generate the same power density purely because of the material we're using? Exactly. Okay, great to know that. Thanks so much. Another thing to consider is element design. Thomas, how important is this? It's actually really important because this design can uh, or will affect your element temperature, which actually determines how quick you consume your element. So obviously with the metallic elements, we've got, you know, if we're looking at two different designs here, we've got the wire elements and we've got the strip elements. And obviously, what design factors would we yeah. utilize for either one? The difference here is this element will emit energy much easier. This one will actually heat up itself. So you can't apply the same power density on this element or the strip as you can do on the wire. Ah, I see, I see. Is that because obviously it's, it's quite close together? Exactly. So obviously, if you move the actual um, pitch apart, you would get more power density out of yeah. that. So that is but actually quite physical. simultaneously, you will actually reduce the amount of material in that surface area. So it has like, to be calculated. Again, that has a fact. So yeah. we're obviously looking at the calculation. What about when we go, obviously, to another metallic one, the tubital? Yeah, this is, a, as you said, a metallic type that has been optimized for performance. And in order to be able to use it at higher power, we are using the APM wire. And in terms of the size of the elements. Yeah. Obviously, we're going to get you know design criteria. Obviously, we can only design maybe certain length. Yes, and once again, the APM wire with the higher hot strength actually makes it possible to have a metallic portion yeah. that has a length, let's say, up to three thousand millimeter in yeah. vertical, and still not elongate. And in terms three. of maybe the actual diameter, can we make this two, three hundred millimeters in diameter? Make it really big. Uh, the, the element is available uh, in sizes up to 170 millimeter OD or the what, ceramic. Why is it restricted to the 170? Uh, since the element in horizontal use need to be carried by the tube, if we make it bigger, the weight to be carried by the tube will become too big. So, so again, it's a design factor. We can only optimization. design it. I get you. So we can only design it a certain length and a certain diameter purely because of uh, decided factors like the yeah. tube. Uh, with the ceramic ones, we have a spiral silicon carbide. Yeah, as well as different uh, way of regulation and control. This one is mounted for one side. If you have like a bar, you can actually apply the current running through it from one side to the other of the furnace. Okay, so we can terminate this from one end. Yeah. We're obviously with the solid elements, we have to connect to either end. So yeah. again, we're looking at design criteria 
and for furnace temperature application. And what about this one? This is an unusual one. We have the small ones, obviously, that we know we hang vertically. Yeah. What is this one? It's a special design to make it possible to really concentrate a high amount of power in a small volume. Okay, so rather than having lots of these hanging down, we can utilize that. Yeah, typically you would put this in a radiating panel in the furnace roof and then like a heating uh, source for the goods below. So you could have an array of them and get yeah. a lot of design and a lot of energy into that. Yeah. Now we've gone through the basics, temperature, atmosphere, power density and design. Thomas, what other factors would, should we consider? Yeah, the first one in mind is uh, the, the long life. But now with the increasing size of the equipment, electrically heated, uh, predictability becomes more and more important. And that strongly affects uh, the cost of running equipment since you have uh, also considered the downtime. And obviously cost is a critical factor yeah. these days. Obviously everyone's looking to reduce the costs. Yeah. Thomas, great to have you here again. Expertise, all is welcome. Glad to be here, Stephen. Thank you. So to sum up this topic, we conclude that there are many factors to consider when choosing the correct electrical heating elements, but the preference will always be yours. If you put the time and effort into choosing this, it will pay off in the end. Thank you for watching. Thomas, there you go, third and last. Unusual type of element, would you say? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay.